Good morning, Go Church. How are you? All right. For those of you who don't know, my name is John Wyand. I have the privilege of uh, serving as the leader of our, our youth team. So that's middle school and high school. And today I want to pose a question. It's a very simple question. It's a very basic one. One that we don't ask very often in the church setting. And that is, I want to know what makes you angry. I asked that question in my youth group a few weeks back. <clears throat> we were reading about the man with the deformed hand in the temple and how Jesus wanted to heal him, but the Pharisees were waiting to see if he would heal somebody on the Sabbath and they were trying to catch him, breaking the law. And it said that Jesus was angry at their hard heart and he healed the man anyway. So I want to ask you today, what makes you angry? I think it's an important question, and I think we see in that moment that there is a time and a place to be angry. Anger is a valid emotion that God gave us. One, two, three, four, five. That is the number of kids while I was talking who died from poverty. That makes me angry. It makes me angry that a third of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. It makes me angry that by the time I finish this sermon, over 500 children will be dead. That makes me angry. And I found that it's not good enough to just be angry. You have to do something about it. That there are things that God has put in our heart that make us angry because we are the people that he is calling to find a solution. <clears throat> Excuse me, to find a solution. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about what the Bible says about social justice. And more in particular, what the Bible says the church's response should be to social justice issues in the world. Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. So my first point, you can write this in your notes. We are to defend the rights of who? The afflicted and needy. We're going to focus for a second on that. The subject of our defense the afflicted, and the needy. I know a lot of churches, I know a lot of Christians, the subject of their defense is themselves. The subject of their defense are their own ideals. They, they get this idea that if we don't defend the gospel, it'll, it'll die out. Let me tell you something, the gospel doesn't need our help. The gospel is the power of God. We cannot overcome that. Laws cannot overcome that. No matter who gets elected in November, can I remind you that there is a throne above that God sits on? And no matter who sits on the throne in the White House, our God is on the throne in heaven. Amen. Powers on earth, powers in hell, cannot overcome the gospel. God did not place us here to make a really good defense of ourselves and our faith. He placed us here to defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy, those kids who are dying every day. I'm, I'm really glad we sang that hymn before the throne of God above because it says in there, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason we don't have to defend ourselves is because Christ is in heaven every day pleading on our behalf. We are covered. Yes. And so it's our responsibility to cover those who can't cover themselves, to cover those who don't know the love of Christ. That is our responsibility. In Micah uh, chapter 6, 6 through 8, Micah says, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? 
Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? See, the Old Testament, there are a lot of sacrifices people make when they make a mistake. So should he give of the fruit of his body to make amends for the sin in his soul? And then Micah goes on and he says, He has told you, he meaning God, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Point number two is that justice requires humility. Humble justice. See, in this, this time, Israel was not a very humble nation. They were not a very God-fearing nation. They, they didn't have a good sense of justice. So Micah was reminding them of the importance of these things. I'm reminded of another job that I have, other than, than serving your youth here. I work at Wycliffe Bible Translators. And uh, uh, just recently, I, I moved to another position in the organization. But for the first two years there, I worked in the Human Resources Department. And there was a team of people that I worked with that are remote staff around the United States. And for a long time, I kept sort of chafing with the department for some reason. They would write to my supervisor and say, oh, he forgot to do this. He didn't send this email. This form wasn't sent in on time. And frankly, every single time they did that, they were wrong. And because I worked in HR, I knew well enough to keep documentation of what I was doing. And I was able to show my supervisor, well, no, I, I actually did this here, and they were copied on this email. They say they didn't say, you know, they received. And I kept defending myself. And every time, I felt like I wasn't just defending myself from that team, but also from my supervisor, who, again, because my supervisor worked in HR, had a very investigative mindset and was like, okay, great, well, let's get to the truth of it. It wasn't, you know, let's, let's see what we can do to vindicate your name. It was, let's get to the truth. And so for, for a long time, for almost a year, I always felt really attacked by this other department. And I just, it was, it was irritating me. I was losing joy in the job I was doing. It was a really difficult time. And then something happened uh, this past fall, about six months ago. Uh, I made a real mistake. I actually, I messed up pretty big. And they called me out and my supervisor went through the same, you know, little ordeal. And I admitted to it, and I was like, yes, actually, I did fail to do this. I didn't do it properly. I'm sorry. So I got written up. And God used that to teach me something. It's not my responsibility to approach every situation in a defensive mode, to approach offense in a defensive way. See, Jesus says when, when someone slaps you, what do you do? You turn the other cheek. He didn't say that you, you gear up for a fight. And every time something came against me, I was gearing up for a fight. And long story short, he, he, he completely changed my mindset and I, I started showing them respect even when I didn't feel like I was receiving respect. And, and over time, God worked in that relationship and restored so much. And in the last few months in that position, I found true joy in what I was doing that I hadn't felt in over a year. And all of that came out of me just being humble and realizing, you know, sometimes I mess up. And I just, I'm going to respect them, no matter what they say, no matter how they react. And now I have several friends in that department. And God is, is so faithful when we approach justice with a sense of humility and not a sense of, I'm right, you're wrong, let's fight. God moves. He moves. And First John Chapter 3, 16 and 20. John writes, We know love by this, that he, meaning Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him and whatever our heart condemns us for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So point number three is that justice comes from loving, loving in both deed and truth. I love that the Bible doesn't say living. I love that it says loving. 
as Christians, we are called to love in deed and in truth. We talk about justice. Justice happens when we are loving in deed and truth. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King and everything that that he did and that the movement represented, it was amazing. And do you want to know why I believe truly that it worked? Besides the fact that he was a man of God, he was a man of love. And that movement was bred out of love. It was, it was, it was peaceful. And, and they came against so much oppression. And they met that oppression with love. And the heart of a nation was changed. It's amazing to me what love can do. This isn't a new idea, though. You see, John, uh, 1 John 3.16, that first verse, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. It echoes John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. By the way, I didn't grow up on the King James Version, but for some reason, like, that's just the version everyone memorized. Like, whosoever believeth in him, I'm, I don't know, but that's just my experience. The greatest commandment in Matthew 22, the disciples asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? In the Old Testament, there were over 600 commandments. We think of the 10, which there were. Moses brought down off the mountain, but there were over 600 commandments. And the disciples ask him, what's the most important one? And what does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now we think, well, of course, you know, love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's kind of like the first commandment, that have no other gods before him. But then we get this idea that, man, he had such a revolutionary idea that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. That was actually one of the commandments. In Leviticus 19.18, one of those 600 it says specifically, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. There is love. What is that love supposed to look like? Let me tell you something, friends. That love should look like love even if your neighbor is an atheist. They should feel loved. Even if your neighbor is a homosexual or a Muslim. They should feel loved. Right. Your love to them should be love that they can receive. I like that you guys didn't clap. It's not, a, not an easy thing to clap for. But I love Muslims. I love felons. I'm going to say something that's even hard for me to say in my flesh. I love pedophiles and rapists, and I love Hitler and Gandhi. Because Christ first loved me. Because it is by the grace of God that I didn't go down a similar path. It is by the grace of God that I am in here preaching you to you this morning instead of in a mosque saying my prayers and, and bowing to Allah. It is by the grace of God that I am saved, not by what I can do Remember this. Seriously, if this, is, if this is the only thing in my sermon you remember, remember this. Loving our neighbor should come across to them as love. It's so important. It's so important. It's what Jesus did. In Isaiah uh, chapter 1, 16 and 17, it says, Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan and plead for the widow. Right there. Right there. That's everything to me. Do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may be recompensed or repaid 
for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And in this letter to the Corinthians, it wasn't being written to sinners. It was being written to the church. I mean, we're all sinners. We're just redeemed. So point number four is we should seek justice because we will be judged. A lot of Christians, I I hear, we get this idea that, that when Christ died on the cross, that he spared us from judgment. When Christ died on the cross, he spared us from hell. There is still judgment to be had right there in 2 Corinthians, New Testament. It says this, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be repaid for the things that we did on earth, good or bad. Now, we're not going to be sent to hell for them. We are saved and we will live eternally in heaven with God. But there is still judgment to be had. You see, we, we, we know that we are saved by grace through faith. Not by what we can do. Our salvation is not in how much we give to the poor and the needy. How many of those starving children we save. That's not where our salvation comes from. But the Bible also says that faith without works is dead. And this is why. Because there will be judgment for us. There will be. And faith without works is dead. I heard a quote once, um, it's been attributed to a lot of different people, so I have no idea who said it first. But it says, justice, if you had to define justice, if we could put justice up there, the definition that they would give is that justice is what love looks like in public. Godly love, that agape love, that that love that, that never gives up that doesn't boast, that isn't angry. You know, in in 1 Corinthians 13, when it, it gives all those different definitions of love, we need to remember something, that God is love. Those are all definitions of God, too. Not just of us, that that he doesn't boast in himself. That he isn't envious and angry all the time. There's a a point that I had. I was talking to the youth, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. And we were talking about this idea of what Jesus did on the cross and what his sacrifice really meant. We talked about his death. We talked about his resurrection. And we talked about the idea that Jesus saved us from an angry God. That God was ready to smite the world. That he was, he was just waiting and waiting for a chance to send somebody to hell. And we talked about how that's not what the Bible says. That Jesus didn't save us from God. He saved us from ourselves. The wages of sin is death. Death is what we deserve. Not because God hates us, but because God is pure and holy and just. And sin cannot be in his presence. And so we needed Christ to die for us so that we could meet the Father. That's what the the Bible says. It it says that Jesus said, and I love the way he said it. He didn't say that the only way to heaven is through me. It's implied by what he said, but what he actually said is, no one comes to the Father except through me. What Jesus was proclaiming was not a get out of hell free ticket. It was a relationship with God, with the creator of the universe. It's love in public. That is what justice is. In Exodus 22, uh, verses 21 through 24, I believe these are all in the program, so if you can't flip there as quickly as I start reading, I apologize. It says, You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan, If you afflict him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives will become widows, and your children fatherless. In Matthew uh, 25, 31 through 46, this is a a bit of a longer passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a little repetitive. But Jesus is talking. And he says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory 
and all the angels with him. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And we'll pause right there for just a second. It says, Come, you who are blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom. And then the reason, the because of that statement, is all of the things that they have done. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of those brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And then we, in the, the following passages, we see the reverse of that. We see what happens to those who didn't clothe the naked, who didn't visit the sick and those in prison, who didn't feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty. It is not good. It's not good. Truly, I say to you, verse 45, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The fifth point is if we don't seek justice, there are consequences. But I I don't want this sermon to just be all fire and brimstone, and if you don't help the the poor and the weak and the afflicted and the needy that you're going to hell, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the consequences aren't just for us, they're for them, the people who are dying right now. By the time I finish my sermon, 525 people will have died because they didn't have food. They didn't have water. They were poor. Because what I make in a single hour is like 10 times what they make in an entire day. But because I needed the new Xbox and the new PS4 and I needed to replace my shoes because they were starting to get a little wrinkly and, you know, I I work in the president's office and you can't have wrinkles on your shoes. And by the time I pay for all those things, I barely have enough for a 10% tithe and I have to give that to the church. And then then the poor and the needy, well, we're just going to save that for the evangelistic associations, you know, Christ for All Nations, Reinhard Bonnke, that's here in Orlando, and we're going to let them do that work. Christianity, being a Christian, becoming a Christian, putting your faith in Christ, is a personal decision. It so much is. But we have turned Christianity into a personal lifestyle. And can I say to you that the Great Commission is not just for missionaries. The Great Commission is for each of us. Go into all the world preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out devils, raise the dead. Freely you have received, freely give. We don't deserve grace. We don't deserve hope. The hope that we have, we don't deserve. I don't deserve. The Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. That includes me, that includes our pastor, that includes your family, your kids, your parents, your cousins, that weird uncle who's in prison, I don't know. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And it was a free gift so that, what does the Bible say? None should boast. I am not saved because I'm like super good. And I'm not standing up in front of you because I'm more righteous than you. I am just a man, a flawed one at that. Ask my wife. I make mistakes. I screw up. I say the wrong thing sometimes. Sometimes when I'm trying to talk about love, I get angry. It doesn't make sense. We have all fallen short. We have all messed up. But the story doesn't end there. 
That's why Christ came for us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said something that I just truly love. He said, we are not to simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, is a, a man that I look up to greatly in the faith. During World War II, he couldn't stand the injustice done to God's people. The, the horrible things that the Nazis were doing to the Jews. He knew of them, and he couldn't sit idly by anymore. For the first time, it clicked in his mind what it meant to defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. That those Jewish people were afflicted, that they were in need. And that he wasn't supposed to just sit in church and defend himself and his own rights and get angry when a law he didn't like passed. I don't know how many of you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer's story, but he ended up being involved in several plots to try and assassinate Hitler, try and overthrow the Nazi regime. He was a pastor and a theologian and a great man of faith. He has a, a, a book that he wrote called The Cost of Discipleship. He was martyred for his efforts. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Uh, it, there's a lot of dramatization in that movie that you know, Hollywood likes to add things. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the core people involved in planning that attempt at overthrowing the Nazi regime, and it almost worked. But it didn't. Some of them were caught. He was caught, and eventually he was killed. But he died fulfilling the great commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. He died defending the rights of the afflicted, and the needy. He was dead long before I was born. But one day I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to see him. I'm going to talk to him. And I'm going to thank him because his story encourages me. It encourages me when, when I feel oppressed that I have a great high priest in heaven who is pleading for me. And I need to man up. I need to pull my pants up. I need to go over and I need to defend other people because I'm taken care of. Pope John Paul II once said, all are called to live in justice and work for peace. No one can claim exemption from this responsibility. All are called, all of us, to live in justice and work for peace. I had a cousin once, got a dog, a rescue from a pound, and uh, it was two or three years old, it was a half lab, half golden retriever, personally my dream dog, adorable, big, you know, the, the kind of dog where it's, it's like just ridiculously happy to see you every time you walk in the door, and, and you get a really big dog, and you want it to be a lap dog, and like, even though it's huge, you just love that it wants to come up and hug you all the time. Uh, but this dog had been abused violently for years. It was about three years old, and in that time, it didn't know what a good touch from a person was. So when you would try to pet the dog, it would whine and cry and scream. All that dog knew how to do was cower and be afraid. That's an ugly thing to see in a dog. It's an even worse thing to see in a human being. There are millions and millions and millions of people in the sex trade, in human trafficking. All they know how to do is cower and be afraid. They don't know the love of Christ. They don't know what it's like for another human being to love them. I'm not up here to, to make you feel bad and tell you that you're not doing a good job or you're not doing enough or you need to do more. I'm here to tell you that the Bible says that we are to defend the rights of the afflicted and needy, whatever that looks like, whatever it looks like. If it means that we die, so be it. Paul said that to die is gain. If we die as Christians, what happens? Not a rhetorical question. Anyone want to yell it out? What happens? 
eternity with God. We go to heaven. That's what happens. If I drop dead walking out of this sanctuary, you know what happens? In an instant, I am face to face with Christ. That is a good day for me. That's going to be hard on my family. They're going to miss me. But to die is gain. And so I should not hold back from pursuing justice for others out of fear for my own well-being because God will take care of me. Whether that means that it'll work and they'll be free or if that means that I pass away and I'm with him. Either way, God is faithful. That's the paradox of Christianity. Either way, God is faithful. Going back to World War II, I'm reminded of a story that I heard in college about a church in Germany. They were only a few miles away from a concentration camp and a lot of Germans didn't actually know about them. They were, they were hidden away. A lot of Germans did know about them, but a lot didn't. The leadership in this church started to wonder when trains, there was a, a train track that would go right out through the, the, the back of the church, maybe 15, 20 feet away from the building itself. And the train wasn't transporting troops or food to the front line. It was transporting Jews to a concentration camp. And while they were there, in the middle of their worship service, they could hear the cries and the pleads for help from the hundreds of people that were on the train. You know what the choir director was telling the worship team? As the train started to go by and you started to hear the screams of the people knowing they were going to their death. You know what he did? This is, this is a very liturgical church and there's a large choir. And he looks at the choir and he's mouthing for them to sing louder so the church doesn't hear it. Sing louder. Brothers and sisters, let us not sing louder. When we see injustice in this world, let us do something about it. Let us get out there, give money, give time, give our treasure, our talents, whatever we have to give, let us give. Let us not just sing louder. I'm gonna close with this. The greatest injustice that ever happened on this earth, the greatest injustice Again, oddly enough, it was also the greatest moment of justice. And that was when a sinless Savior died so that my sinful soul could be counted free. And now, God the just, his title, the just, is satisfied to look on Christ and pardon me. The greatest injustice of this world is that a sinless man died, was murdered, but he died in the greatest act of justice, and that was to pardon all of us, to pardon me, to pardon you, all of us who make mistakes, who sin, who screw up, that is why he died, for justice, because God's sense of justice wasn't sending us to hell. God's sense of justice was sending a Savior to die for us so that we didn't have to. God didn't create hell for us. Look in the Bible. He created hell for Satan, for the demons that, that followed him out of heaven. God doesn't want to send any of us to hell. And as a matter of fact, if we go there, it's not because he sent us. It's because he gave us free will. Because you can't have love in a relationship without free will. If I looked at Hannah and she didn't, Hannah's my wife, if I looked at her and said, I know you don't love me, but you're going to be my wife anyway, and we're going to be in this relationship until you die. There is no love there. There can't be love without freedom. So God, in his love for us, gave us the freedom to choose. Gave us the freedom to choose. I choose life. 
You know, it says in Joshua in the Old Testament, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not because I'm better than anybody. It's because there's something bigger than me, more important than me. And when I fail to seek justice, the consequences aren't just for me. It's for the, pa- the people that I failed to defend. There are consequences for them too. Let's close in, in, in prayer and then the pastor has a few words. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love, for your grace and your mercy that you shared with each of us by sending your son to die for us. I thank you that you are a good, good father. We thank you and, and we love you and we praise you and I ask that, that you will be with us in the next day, in the next week, that you will remind us of your love, of your justice, that you will help and empower us to defend the orphan and the widow, to not get angry at our oppressors, but to rely on you to deliver us from evil as we go and and attempt to deliver others. Help us defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. We thank you for these things. We thank you for your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks a lot, John. What a great job in sharing the word. So what is it? that makes you angry. Don't just get angry, do something about it. One of the things that is very, very important to the heart of God and to go church is that we call you to make a decision that we're faithful with the opportunity. You know, in this room right now, this will only happen once. Only this speaker, these people, these songs, this situation, it's only a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime ordeal. And we ask, how does God been speaking to you today, and what does he want you to do? Hear me in saying this. You cannot do anything about the tragedies in our world of people dying and people being abused and people being thrown by the wayside until you have dealt with your own relationship with God. That's the first step. If you are motivated to doing something today to to help make this world a better place for the kingdom of God, The kingdom of God has got to come and infiltrate your life. And only through that can the power in you put forth. That is what makes a difference. You know why we don't go? You know why we don't do anything? It's because we care more about ourselves than the things of this world. of of meeting the needs of others. That great command. So what I would ask you today, do you have Christ inside of you? The hope of glory, the power of God living in you. It is that power that can change the world, but it starts with changing you and me. How, How can that happen? Well, the Bible tells us that we must admit that we're sinners and that we have taken God's place in our own life, that we have sit on the throne of our own life and that we have pushed God out. We we are God of our own selves and we've got to repent of that. We've got to confess that and say we're sorry. And secondly, John did such a great job talking about Jesus is the answer. He says, no man comes to the Father except through me. That Jesus came and paid the penalty of our sin so that we could know God. It is in believing in Jesus that he died, that he was buried, and that the, the, the uh, 
grave could not hold him, sin could not conquer him, and death could not defeat him. That he is alive. And that power that resurrected him from the dead is the same power that brings forgiveness of our sin and healing from our sin nature. So lastly, to be a child of God, to have forgiveness of sin, and to enter into that relationship, you have to ask. You have to acknowledge. You have to surrender. Would you do that today? That is the first step on this journey of God using us to change the world. It can't happen unless that step happens. The world inside of me and the mess inside of me, God, fix me. If you're here today and you want to do that, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be forgiven, shall become, get this, a child of God. If that's you, would you, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes, everyone. If you'd like to take Jesus as your God, as your Savior, as your Lord, pray this prayer, silently, sincerely, from your heart to God's heart. Dear God, I am sorry. I've been living for myself and not you, and, and that is sin. I've been sitting on the throne of my life, and, and that's your rightful place, and I'm sorry. I admit that I'm a sinner, and I need help. I acknowledge that you created me, and that you love me, and that you want a relationship with me, and I stand in the way of that. So I surrender. I, I give up my place. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He's the only way to heaven, and that no man comes to you except through Him, and that He died, He was buried, and He rose again, that He is the answer. Answer to every problem in this world. And so Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my everything, to be my Savior, to be my Lord, be my master. Come sit on the throne of my life right now, right here, today. I am making a commitment to you. Save me now. In Jesus' name, amen. With your eyes still closed and your head still bowed, if you pray that prayer, two things. Would you please fill out the connection card and check the box on the back? Please do that. And would you please let someone know that you made that decision? And would you let me pray for you right now and celebrate with you right now? If you prayed and made that decision today, would you just slip up your hand all over this place today? Thank you so much. Amen. Anyone else? Praise God and praise God. Yes, sir. Thank you. Amen and amen. Anyone else? Yes, right there. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Let us know. Let us know. Let your friends know. Let your family know. If you're in the house and you would say, Pastor Barry, I'm really struggling today and I need prayer, would you just slip up your hand? If that's you, just slip up your hand. I'm struggling. I need prayer today. Amen. Amen. God sees it. We see it. And we care. Amen. God is with you. He is for you. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What he wants to do is bear your load. Let him today. Tell him and confess to him that you can't do it. I can't do it, Lord. I believe that there's a group in this room that are saying, God, I don't like what's happening in our world. I don't like that people are dying because they don't have food. I don't like that people are being abused. I don't like it that people are in sex slavery. I don't like addictions. 
And God, I make myself available today. And I say, here am I, Lord. Use me. If that's you and you want prayer for that, would you just slip up your hand? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. All over this place. All over this place. Would you stand to your feet? Would our prayer warriors come? Dear God, in the final moments of this time together this morning, I ask that you would open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out your blessings upon all these people that we would experience you and the power that you forever reign. You forever reign. There's not going to be a time that you don't reign, that you are not in control. And God, we ask that you would use us and that you would work out your sovereignty through us, your people. And, and Lord, forgive us for turning ahead. Forgive us for turning our backs. Forgive us for overlooking the things that you are calling your people to take a stand against. We repent of that. We ask your forgiveness of that. And God, the people who have prayed to receive Christ today, bless them, God. Those who are making commitments to you, Lord, and saying, God, use me, send me. God, bless them today. God, may this time of invitation be powerful. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, would you come and allow one of these godly men and women to pray for you? If you pray to receive Christ, come and, and let us pray over you and celebrate with you and, and get excited with you. Whatever your needs are, let's carry them to the Father right now and let's worship Him. You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When my darkness closes in 